What I was going to talk about uh, was about decision making, and uh, that's quite a few little exercises we could have done. Anyway, I mean, uh, one of the most important things that leaders have to do is to make decisions. But anyway, all human beings have to make decisions. But often you find that, um, you know, if you're a brain surgeon, you have to make decisions. If you're going around collecting the rubbish, um, rubbish collector, you also have to make decisions. So who gets paid the most? A brain surgeon or a rubbish collector? This one is a brain surgeon. Yeah, so why is that? Because it's unfair. Because hmm? it's unfair. It's unfair? Yeah, you need right. more. Uh, um, many more years of study. And okay. I think so, though, that the much more scale is hmm? needed. A brain surgeon is not a specialized work, not really. That's good to a lot of studying and then uh, somebody else becomes rubbish. He does make decisions. It's not in, it's not supposed to as such in that sense. No, no, no. Thinking partly in terms of decision making. If a, if a brain surgeon or an airline pilot makes a bad decision, what happens? The wives and sisters are at risk. That's right. Yes. Oh. Whereas well, if you're collecting the rubbish <coughs> or something and you make a bad decision, it's not such a big impact, is it? No, but it can be. Sorry? It can be. If a rubbish, rubbish collector, uh, collector uh, doesn't collect uh, the rubbish, mm -hmm. that rubbish can be quite dangerous sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, and some person can get a disease, or maybe right. die. Yes, and so what happens if the rubbish collector So he has an important role in society. I'm not saying it's not important. I mean, definitely it's important. Yes. What I'm saying is, why is it that we pay one person gets paid a lot more than another kind of person? Well, in, in, in these days, they, they qualify people in terms of uh, what they, they study through their lives. In, in terms of um, the doctor, he went to school and he, he had his degree, so he, he is paid by that. But in terms of the rubbish collection, uh, collector, he didn't have uh, so much uh, education, but in another way, he, he has an education through life. And uh, it doesn't have any value uh, in terms of what society thinks about the rubbish uh, collector. Um, and rubbish collectors are very valuable. Um, yeah, but doesn't get the same amount of payment as uh, the doctor. That's the question. Yes. Why is why is not to recognize exactly. for so his, his if, work? If a person had a PhD, could they collect the rubbish? Yeah, but you can study because in these days. <laughs> On these days, every, everything requires a CV. Well, if mean, you go to apply for a, as a job with a job as a cleaner, you have to get to, to give a CV. Yeah, of course. But you, know, you, can, you, can be, you can be very well educated and still collect rubbish, but you won't get paid anymore. But that's why I said it's, it's unfair. Well, if you think it's unfair, I mean, it's just, I'm not going to make any judgments about it. I'm just going to think, well, that's the way it is. Well, uh, can we try and understand why it is the way it is? Brain surgeon needs to study about 10 years to do that, and, if it, and unless, there's a, unless there's a possible reward of big money, he's not going to do that process. So it needs, there needs to be an enticement. I mean, some people might be motivated by career prestige or job satisfaction, but some people say, no, if I study for 10 years, I'm going to get paid 50, you know, I'm going to get paid 500 pounds a week, they just won't do it and they won't have any brain surgeons. Yeah, apparently I've had to study for many years, and also not everybody's capable of reaching that kind of level, um, so there's that aspect as well, and also, you know, it's a lot, lot of responsibility, and so people often get paid according to the amount of responsibility they have to have, and the kind of effect the decisions that they make have, and so, yes, I mean, if you're at the top of a business, for example, not necessarily a brain surgeon, if you're the chairman of a business, then if you, make, if you make bad decisions, that's not just going to affect you, that will affect the whole business and everybody's got a job there. And there have been companies, for example, there was a very big company called, in Britain called GEC, it was the largest, it doesn't exist anymore. Because, you know, the person said it, who founded it and got, put it together, someone called Lord Weinstock, and he's very, very successful, and then when he retired, 
and then they decide to employ somebody else, and you completely change the direction of GEC and invest all the money in something else and solve all the existing things, and you made a terrible, catastrophic mistake, and the business basically went out of business. And you know, thousands of people lost their jobs, thousands of people had, well, millions of people had shares in it, again, lost their. Um, and Lord Weinstock himself, because most of his his wealth was tied up in shares in this company as he found it. He was heartbroken, you know, what happened. And so, you know, you get, so that's why at that kind of level you want to find the best people and sometimes you need to pay a lot of money to attract those kind of people to that kind of level of um, responsibility. Um, but there's not the sort of thing that anybody can do. So that's one of the reasons, I would say, why. You, one, one of the things that's fair they should be paid so much is another question. Mm -hmm. um, but some of them, you know, just, you know, one can think it's fair or unfair, but I don't understand why it is the way it is. Not it's because of the decisions that we have to make. And so is it easy to make decisions? Who here likes making decisions? Depends who it concerns. Sorry? Depends who it concerns. Okay, who concerns? It's just what I want to have for dinner tonight. Then. And then supposing you had to, <coughs> supposing one day you just happened to become the head of a large, of, a, of an army, let's say, in a battle, and you had to decide how to deploy the troops, would you like to do that? <laughs> no, why not? And because people's lives are at risk. Right. I, which, whether I send a battalion A or B here or there, uh -huh. it depends on the lives of the family or B. Yeah, it's, somebody has to make those decisions. What kind of person do you want to be in that kind of role, making those kind of decisions? Someone who is knowledgeable and Yeah. Yes. 
and you have to make good decisions. Mm. And if you don't make good decisions, what happens? The whole thing collapses. Yeah, people get really upset. They feel that's not fair. You made a bad decision there, and this, that, and the other. And you get angry parents coming round, and then you get the offset coming round, and even more stress. And you know, that's, even though people who are head teachers get paid a lot more money, mm. a lot of people don't want the job because they realise I. I don't have the capacity to be able to keep my cool and to make good decisions in this kind of situation. Because a lot of it, leadership is about decision making, or managing is about decision making. You know, when you're a captain on, on a ship, for example, and a storm comes along, you have to make very quick decisions what to do. And you have to know what to do. So you have to have had years and years and years and years of experience. So you don't think, oh, well, this is uh, some bad weather coming up. I'm going to go and Google it and see what I have to do. You don't have time. Or I'm going to go get a book off the shelf. Yes, you don't have time. All that information, all that knowledge, all that experience has to be stored within you and it has to be readily accessible so you can make very simple, very clear and good decisions in a very short space of time. Does that make sense? And so that's why you can find people like that, you get paid, they get paid a lot more because you know, of the responsibility of making decisions. And if they make a bad decision, how do you think they feel? Frustrated. Right? Well, more frustrated. Often they feel incredibly guilty. They exactly. have to live with the fact that, oh, I made a terrible decision and because of the bad decision I made, it wasn't just me who suffered, mm. yeah? The whole of my crew suffered, or and maybe the passengers as well. Mm. Sometimes people can't live with themselves afterwards, and you know, sometimes you come across people who kill themselves because they can't live with the, uh, you know, the decision that they made. Mm. That's why decision making is very important. Mm. One of the most important roles or things that a leader has to be able to do is to make decisions. And sometimes people think, oh, I wish somebody else would make the decision for me. You ever felt like that? Yeah, yeah. Why do I have to choose? Why can't someone else tell me what the best thing to do is? Yeah, and that's the difference between, in that sense, a follower and a leader. A leader is someone who's willing to make those different decisions the hard choices and live with the consequences of the decisions. For a lot of people feel it's too difficult, I wish someone else would decide for me. I wish somebody else would you know, organize everything for me so I don't have to make all these choices myself. Yeah. But which kind of, you know, I mean, so, so this attitude one has also leads to certain kinds of social systems. Mm. What kind of social system comes about when one wants other people to make decisions for one? Like a communist system, no. Sorry? Like a communist system. Well, absolutely, a communism, yeah. Yeah, the communism, yeah. So that the Russians don't sound like Putin and you know, like a strong guy makes all the decisions for them and then they Right. So Putin's not exactly a communist, but anyway, communism, where you have the state makes all the decisions from yes. cradle to grave, you don't have to think about, you know, where to send your children to school, you don't have to think about applying for a job, you don't have to think about this or that or the other, because there's someone who makes all those decisions for you. So I remember why I lived in Russia for seven years and I remember the first time I went, well, not the first time anyway, when I moved there in 1992, I remember going to the university just to have a look, went there with a friend. And I remember when I graduated from university, on the notice board in my department, there was a list of all the names and all the degrees that people got, you know, whether they got first class or T1 or T2 or whatever. And so, you know, I went on to the Moscow State University and again, on the notice board, there was a list of all the candidates and all the degrees they got. I thought that's interesting. Then I said, well, what's that other list over there? And the person said, well, that's the list of where they're going to work. So after you graduated, then some bureaucrat somewhere decided where you were going to work. And so if you're an engineer, they would look and they would say, oh, we need an engineer in this town. And so you are allocated to a particular job. You couldn't, you know, search for a job with yourself. You couldn't think, well, I would like to work in this town, or I'd like to work in this particular kind of job, or actually, even though I study engineering, I'd actually like to do something completely different. And in communism, everyone who's graduated from university is guaranteed a job. The only thing they had to do was surrender the freedom to be able to choose where they wanted to work, or what it was they wanted to do. So all these things were allocated. So they didn't have to make choices, they didn't have to worry about things, it was all decided for them. 
Um, and lots of things were like that. Housing was all like that. Everything was like that. Um, and it's, you know, it's attempting you know, to want that kind of society. Um, what kind of you know, free market, a free society, is one where actually you have to make the choices, you have to make decisions, and you have to live with the consequences of those decisions, whether they're good or bad. Are you recording this? Just a tiny camera. I saw the one in Graham this year. <laughs> no, I don't know, I edited that bit out. <laughs> um, so, I haven't gone to that. Anyway, so, anyway, so decision making is very important. So, yeah, one has to think what qualities do you need to, to be able to make good decisions? What, what goes into making a good decision? What do you think? Experience. Well, well, okay, yeah, I need to experience, yeah, so that's all the background of things like experience and knowledge and that. But, um, you have world. to see the si both sides of the picture so that you can take a, a, a very complete overview mm -hmm. so that when, you, when you're looking to make the decision you can see what's good about deciding one thing and on the other hand, what would be good if you did it the other way? Mm -hmm. What are the pros and cons, the advantages and disadvantages, mm -hmm. and so, so forth? What's, so what do we call this? We call it analyzing. Yeah, you can call it strengths and weaknesses. Uh, and yeah, so this is the process of analyzing. You have to anal if you have to make a decision, you have to analyze the situation. You have to get accumulate as much information about the things as you can. Also, you have to decide what information is most significant and what isn't. Then you have to decide what are the possible options here. Yeah. And you have to weigh out the pros and cons. And then eventually you make a decision. Yeah, something like that, five basic steps in decision making. But it's important to be able to analyze things and to be able to think calmly and coolly and you know, collect all the different relevant information. And also you have to think about the consequences of the decision. You have to think, well, if I decide this, what are the possible consequences going to be? Okay. Whereas if I decide that, what are the possible consequences are going to be? So one has to have faculty of imagination. Yeah, you have to imagine, okay, if I'm running a company and I make this decision to appoint this person to that job, what are the consequences going to be? You have to imagine, okay, if he's working with that group of people, will he be able to do it? Is that the right person? in that kind of situation. You know what I mean? You have to try and imagine the consequences of your decision. Again, so imagination is very important. Any other qualities? Um, analyzing imagination. Well, what about intuition? Intuition? Good. How do you use intuition? It seems as important as an analysis. Sometimes. That's right. So analysis is like based on the intellectual side, but also there's an intuitive aspect, which is um, so, how does intuition then work in this situation? Like visualizing. Sorry? Visualizing the. Uh, visualizing, the, yes. The consequences in the future. Right. Okay. Anything else? How does the intuition. When, when you say about making decisions intuitively, how does it work? It's, you're not relying so much upon the intellectual faculties. What are you relying upon? Feelings and emotions. Feelings, emotions. Yeah. More like tuning in as opposed to you know, right. pulling out the antenna. Mm. Right. Maybe somebody has a sixth sense. It's a bit like a sixth sense in some way. Mm -hmm. You somehow have some sense about almost being able to anticipate mm -hmm. something that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, it's very important to be that kind of a person. Mm -hmm. You somehow you're aware about things which are almost not on a conscious level. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, for example, captains of fire, fire teams, sometimes they go into a burning building, this, this, and this, and sometimes, I mean, I've read about this, this person, he was a leader of the fire team, he, for, for no real reason, he intuitively felt, we have to get out of this building, it's going to collapse. Yeah. And, it, and you know, he told all his men, we've got to go now. And they left, and the whole fort collapsed, and afterwards they went into it and they found out why. But intuitively, you know, he wasn't standing there analyzing the situation and figuring it all out. Just intuitively, the sort of subconscious was working there and, again, making this decision. 
And so again, it's very important then as a leader to be open to that side of oneself, to be able to analyze things critically and intellectually, but also to be in touch with a deeper kind of unconscious aspect, which is often not rationalizable, but somehow you sense actually this is the right thing to do and I have to do it now. Have you read the book Blink by Michael Gladwell? Yes. Yeah, he talks about those that's snap right. decisions. Yeah, snap decisions. Yeah. I think that's probably a good example from actually. Yes. Yeah. It was as a fireman, yeah. That's right, yeah. But they say that the conscious mind can hold seven pieces of information uh -huh. at a time. So it seems with you know with this capacity it's quite limited actually. Very limited. So yeah. imagine if you are, yeah. you know, a head of the industry, what decision can you make? You sure. know, if you seven holding yeah, seven pieces sure. of information. Mm -hmm. Because it's enough. limited to seven. Yeah. The conscious mind, yeah. That's not that. Mm -hmm. It's not a lot, is it? No. It's not no. A lot. But then the unconscious mind that is filled with all kinds of experience and all that stuff is there. And it's, you know, and that's what is all stored there. So you've got zillions of other bits of information there based upon experience and all the books you've read and this, that, and the other. And that sort of comes to bear as well. That's sort of, in that sense, intuition is not. Um, I guess an intuition in that sense needs to be educated, really. It's not just, you know, oh, well, I've got good intuition, but actually one has good intuition because of a lot of thought and experience and reading and, and studying has, in has gone into it in the past, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, that's what one's drawing upon, that sort of unconscious reservoir of experience and, mm -hmm. and study and everything else. Would you say that people who practice a lot are lucky more often? Yes, well that's what I say, to create your own luck. Mm -hmm. yeah. But also seems that the, the bravest decision you make with better results, mm -hmm. I mean that's been my experience in my life. Mm -hmm. the, bravest, the bravest I've been, yeah. the better results. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, it, is, it is, isn't it? The more you risk, the mm -hmm. more you stand to gain. That's the same thing really, isn't it? Yeah. The more you're ready to... Well, that's like gambling. Risk or sacrifice. Yeah, if you're, not prepared to take, if you're not prepared to take a risk, then, yeah. Nothing ventured, nothing, nothing gained. Nothing gained, that's right. And so leaders often have to stick their necks out, mm -hmm. make these kind of incredibly risky decisions. Mm -hmm. And usually face a lot of criticism when they do that. That's right. Yeah. Big time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, yeah, that's right. Everybody says you're an idiot. What are you doing that for? <laughs> And that sense you need the courage of your convictions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you know, that's what helps with the intuitive aspect because you could not. It's somehow a decision which is coming from the depth of your being as opposed to just a little intellectual pros and cons kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's something much deeper. Well, all these elements uh, make a very important thing, which it is a personality. Sorry, what you say? All these elements uh, yes. are on top makes a very important thing, which it is the personality of the leader. Yeah, the personality and character as well. Yeah. <coughs> personality, everyone has different personalities. The characters, <coughs> you know, about making a decision and sticking to it and living with the consequences of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so let's have a look at... Um, so I, this I showed you last week. So a good leader then, you know, this, it's not... This is like a decision-making continu continuum. And so a good leader is not someone who just does it one way or just does it the other way, but has this sort of flexibility. So we looked at this last week, I'll just go through it again. So the far left end there, the manager makes decisions and then announces it. So in that sense, the manager makes the decision and everyone has to carry it out. And then the far right-hand side, the manager permits his subordinates to function and to, you know, present them with a problem and says, you know, let's solve this problem together and you can come up with a solution to these problems. So in that sense, the manager is not saying, he's not making a decision, he's actually involving all the people working with him in the decision-making process. So it's not that one is good and one is bad, it's just that a flexible manager or leader is is able to realize that a different process is appropriate at different times. If, for example, the one end, the far left end, if there you're, you know, as I said, you're in charge of, um, you know, a fire engine, if the 
captain the fire team, sometimes you just have to make incredible snap decisions. You can't sit around and say, well, boys, man, what do you think? What should we do for this fire? You know, should we stay in here and fight it a bit longer or should we go, you know, <laughs> can't do that. So a little bit depends upon the situation, how much time there is, how, many, how much knowledge and skill the people <coughs> you're working with have, all these different constraints. So what are the advantages of far left-hand side? What are, the, what are the advantages of just a leader or manager who just makes all the decisions himself and issues them? Well, there is not, there isn't uh, that much uh, discussion about the issue to be solved. Right. So whatever the leader decides, so people will follow. Okay, so when is it good to, to be like that? Like in the example you just gave in terms of the fire fire. In a military situation. Fire. Emergency. Okay, one situation may be emergency, the shortage of time. Okay. When else might a manager do that or leader do that? When there's a battle going on in a military situation. Well again that's um, Shortage of time, you can't match, you know, it's, it's an emergency situation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people just can't agree and it's just nobody can come to a, a consensus and so sometimes they just need somebody with the confidence of their vision to say, okay, just trust me and we'll do it this way. It's sort of force a direction on the group. Especially big groups. Is that a good thing to do if you have time? No, I mean, if they, if they, can't, if they just can't agree and then right. you give them, give them a discussion but mm -hmm. just different factions and they just can't agree. And sometimes they need a confident leader to say, let's do it this way. Um, yeah, sometimes, but does that really solve the problem? Uh, sometimes yes, sometimes, 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 sometimes yes, sometimes no. Yeah, rather than not making a decision, yeah. Uh, okay, and another time is when, when the leader or manager actually really knows best, and the people who are under him or with him don't have much experience, or don't have the knowledge or skills. In which case they don't have much to contribute in that situation. He realizes I'm much more experienced, they're all very inexperienced. So in this situation, there's no point in asking them. Actually, I need to teach them in that sense. And I need to train them. And in that sense, I'm the master, they're the apprentices. Yeah. That kind of situation. So at this and then at the far end there, when when <coughs> When would it be good to do that, use that kind of approach? What do you need in order to do the approach on the far right? People who are very capable and able to do things without having to be supervised all the time. Right. Yes. So people who can take initiative, who have some kind of either education or training or knowledge or abilities, mm -hmm. where they can actually be successful um, in a supported environment, but not necessarily, you know, yes. pushed so, from above. Right, so as a manager you realise that all the people working with you, they're all, they all have experience, they're all skilled, they're all qualified, they're all very capable, they're all very motivated, and you realise that actually they may have better ideas than you have. Mm -hmm. And so you just give them a lot of the freedom and a lot of responsibility, so these are the kind of limits and you, know, you work with this kind of framework. And of course you need time as well. So what are the advantages of doing it like that? <coughs> the people feel empowered. People feel empowered, yes. Anything else? More satisfied. Hmm? More satisfied. They take yeah. ownership of the situation. It's a lot more satisfying. People feel ownership. They feel, you know, I, I can have a say in this. You know, so in that sense they feel much more committed to it. Mm. And often you get a much better plan, actually. Mm. You know, if there's just the far left end, you know, there's a, it's, the whole plan relies upon one person's knowledge and experience, which is, in that sense, limited, even if the person is very experienced. But at this far right hand end, if you have a lot of people who've got a lot of experience and knowledge, and they pool that knowledge and experience together, you can come up with a much better plan than any single person could have had. In that sense, you're drawing on everybody's skills and abilities and you know, perspectives, and you can develop a much better plan than if it's just the manager coming up with his plan. That makes sense? Mm -hmm.
uh, you know, it has lots of different advantages. One, a better plan. Everybody's more involved. People feel like actually I can fulfill my potential. I could use my abilities, my knowledge, my skills in this situation. You know, people are, uh, respect me, and you know, you feel it's a much more satisfying kind of job, much more satisfying kind of team to work with. In a sense, the one on the left would be appropriate in a situation where people are in a position of being very new or trainees mm. or not very experienced mm. or very young or something where there's not a lot of, you know. Right. Have you been in that situation yourself? Yeah. And how did it go? Um, I think the problem was in that job that I had a when I was a trainee at that time, um, there wasn't enough interaction with the manager. Mm -hmm. He did meet with us occasionally, one by one or as a group, but I think the general consensus of opinion amongst us was a mm -hmm. lot of dissatisfaction that we wanted to give a lot more feedback mm -hmm. to that manager, mm -hmm. and he just wasn't there to listen to the feedback. Mm -hmm. And when he did, he didn't do anything about it. So it was a very frustrating experience, mm -hmm. but I think we followed the guidelines. Mm -hmm. That wasn't so much the problem. Mm -hmm. It was the, the amount of feedback, the dynamic within that particular company wasn't mm -hmm. dynamic enough. Sure. So if it had have been, I think it would have been quite successful. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah so it's a sort of cultural thing sometimes, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You just feel the whole company is not like yeah. that. Yeah. And you feel kind of frustrated and you feel, well, maybe I'll go somewhere else. I think it has a lot to do with respect as well, because yeah. if you meet somebody in the corridor, if they just ignore you mm. and walk straight past you, even mm. if they're your manager or the mm. manager of the manager, mm. it would be very m much more meaningful if they say hello or good sure. morning. Mm. Whereas if they just ignore you, mm. I think it it is a bit soul-destroying because you feel like you don't exist, you have no meaning, no purpose in life, and you're just a number, mm -hmm. so... Has anybody been on a good experience at the far left end, either as a manager or as a, as a follower apprentice? I'm not to run a hotel. <laughs> 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 
so things are going to come in. Okay, so I had a couple of things here. This isn't. Okay, it's a little exercise here, it's the one which I just put on a PowerPoint, the other ones I want to print out, but we can try this. This is a um, little exercise for testing your ability to be able to solve problems. And it's the kind of thing that often managers have to do. They've got all these bits of information and they have to try and you know, work out what's really going on here and to be able to make a decision. So, I think it's that paper here. Yeah. And there's uh, some pens. And uh, can you read it? Yes, five taxi drivers have been summoned to pick up five fares at a London club. On arrival, they find their passengers are slightly intoxicated, have been drinking too much. Each man has a different first and last name, a different profession, a different destination, and each man's wife has a different first name. And able to determine who's wife, who's who, and who's going where, taxi drivers ask you to find out. Who is the baker? What is Bert's last name? Who is going to Baker Street? Barker Street. Who is going to Barker Street? So this is the information you've got. So you have to answer these four questions. Three questions. Who is the baker? What is Bert's last name? And who is going to Barker Street? Do you want to do this individually or as a team of two? <coughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm? Individual, let's see who's the best. Okay, alright. Okay. Let's see how long it takes you to work it out. To the information, and they have to be able to analyse them and to solve these kind of problems. Yeah. Or if you're on a battlefield, you just have to be able to process all this kind of random information very, very quickly. And not everyone can do it, I can't do it. <laughs> My brain's too old now. <laughs> But you know, you could, you could hear the process and you can see you have to, from this clue, this clue, this clue, you work up that. So you have to be able to hold these clues in your head and form the pattern. And it's not easy to do that, not very many people can do that. <coughs> and so I remember the book, it said the average time of solving it is about 30 minutes. If you solve it in 15, you're extremely good. So, you know, that's, these are the kind of, um, yeah puzzles that people have to solve when they're making decisions. And that's why people get paid, some people get paid a huge amount of money because they can solve these kind of problems. You know, going back to the brain surgeon thing, how do you get to this particular part of the brain where you do this and this and this and you've got all these pieces of information you have to hold together and you have to work out a solution to the problem. And not everyone can do that. And there are very few people that can do that and that's why some businesses that pay lots of money to try and attract these kind of people to their business. Um, in the city of London they call it talent. Whereas uh, if you look at the kind of performance of how you wonder is it how talented are they really? <laughs> but that's just the way it works, you know. There aren't very many people who can do this kind of thing. And these are the kind of decisions that uh, you know, people at the top of their game have to make to solve problems. And, you know. Anyway, so as I said, what solution then? Maybe move on to tea and coffee. Yes, for sure. I think we all deserve some tea and coffee. We have the individual taxi drivers. I mean, after work out, you'd be able to follow us. Then we need to take a couple of people. Well, they ended up asking this bystander to do it for them because they couldn't work it well, out. I'll see that one. And you're the bystander. These taxi drivers said, you know, we've got all these drunk drunks in our taxis. We don't know where to take them. Can you work out? This problem for us, please. 